So listen to these verses from Joshua chapter 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Long ago, your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and I handed them over to you. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat fruit of vineyards and olive, olive yards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out all the peoples and Am the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are our God. And yet we are drawn to others. You want our whole heart for you are holy. Open your word for us this day and claim us. Amen. Joshua, born in Egypt, redeemed from bondage, even as he led his people to freedom. The one at Moses' right hand, as Moses led the people through the Red Sea, through the years of weary wandering, through the murmuring and rebellion of their fearful and frustrated people. The one who waited faithfully at the foot of Mount Sinai for Moses. There were miles to go and promises to be kept, but Joshua still had a lot to learn. When they came back down the mountain, they heard the mayhem going on around the golden calf. And they wondered what it was. And Joshua got it wrong. He thought the camp was being attacked. But Moses knew a pagan palooza when he heard one. Joshua was one of the 12 spies that Moses sent out to reconnoiter the promised land. What they saw was what God promised, a land flowing with milk and honey. But those spies dreaded the idea of what it would take to take it. And so they came back to Moses, and they brought those serious doubts with them, and those doubts were rooted in their own insecurity about God's promises to this promised land project. And they told Moses to forget the whole thing. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, had the courage to speak faithful truth in the face of fear. But Caleb spoke first not Joshua. Still, Moses, the talent spotter, saw something in his young disciple. And over the next 40 years, that's one heck of an internship, 40 years, Moses and Joshua covered a lot of ground together. But there were many miles yet to go and promises to be kept. With Joshua at his side, Moses led the people, sometimes dragging them, kicking and screaming, to the very threshold of the promised land. The prophet, like no other, had come so far, but he would go no further. It was for Joshua, his disciple, 
the blessing of his master to lead the people across the Jordan River. God had work for Joshua to do as a military leader to lead his wandering people where God wanted them to be. God had work for Joshua to do as a shepherd, to nurture the people's faith, to guide them on the way to being the people who God wanted them to become. And so after Moses died, the Lord spoke to Joshua. Think about that. And first and foremost, God began those words with a promise. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. With a promise like that, we can do almost anything. And so with the blessing of that promise from God, God then gives Joshua a command. But God doesn't tell him what to do. God tells him how to be. Be strong and courageous. That's all. God tells him again, more emphatically, only be strong and very courageous. Then God tells Joshua what to do. Follow the law that I gave to Moses. The Lord expects more of Joshua than simply knowing God's word and teaching God's word. It has to be part of Joshua's life, who Joshua is. It has to be on his lips, meditating on it day and night. Joshua, the soldier, the shepherd, must never be too busy or distracted to meditate on God's word, to worship, or to pray. The same goes for us, my friends. God has work for Joshua to do. And the future of his people depends on how he does. And Joshua is going to need courage and strength. And on the off chance, when God was speaking to him, that he didn't catch the first two times, God repeats the command a third time. I hereby command you, strong and courageous. And thankfully, God also repeats the promise, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Israel stands on the threshold between past and future. I think we all know that feeling. For 40 years, people have been asking, are we there yet? I think we all know that feeling. But this time, the answer is yes. But that yes answer doesn't mean they get to unpack the caravan and sing around the campfire. Joshua has been wandering with these folks for 40 years. This is a new generation that will make the crossing. But I think we all agree that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Why would this new generation be any different from their parents or their grandparents, the same stubborn and rebellious and fickle, unreliable people? And that land flowing with milk and honey just over there on the other side of the river 40 years ago, when Moses sent him out, Joshua scouted out that land and the people who lived in it. It hadn't changed that much either. So Joshua knew enough to know that this was going to be dangerous. Crossing the Jordan, the risks are great. So are God's words of promise and presence. Joshua knew enough to know that there were miles to go. Joshua knew enough to know that there are promises to be kept, promises from God and promises from the people. That call, God's call for us to make promises is at the core of this and that we make those promises rooted in the promises that have already been made to us. Joshua answered God's call to obedience and God commanded him to make sure that the people understood that that call was for them as well. And so for another 30 years, Joshua did just that. Moses 
the disciple, Moses' disciple and soldier and spy became the leader of armies who went forth with violence we find disturbing and a challenge to our idea of holiness. The pastor who shepherded and nurtured the faith of his people as they became who they were promising to become. And so here at the end of his life, in this story, this text we just read, Joshua had led his stiff-necked, rebellious people, nurturing a kind of faith that would have made Moses marvel. Joshua lived to a ripe old age, having seen the promises that generations before could only dream of fulfilled. And so even at the end of his life, his work is not at an end. He may be 100 years old, but God has work for Joshua to do. And so he calls yet another generation of leaders and people together, and they gather at Shechem, the holy place where Abraham built altars. And he says to them, it's your turn. You have miles to go. You have promises to keep. And the lure of other gods will always be with you. But I'm telling you, when in Canaan, do not do as the Canaanites do. God who was with us will be with you. In the past, God promised to be with us. God promised us a future. And you are living witnesses that God kept those promises. And so I ask you, Will you make a promise to remember that past in your future? Joshua is not asking them to make a statement of belief or give some kind of deposition before the church council. God wants a sacred promise, a sacred commitment. Will you choose to revere the Lord? Will you choose to serve the Lord in sincerity and in faithfulness? You have to choose. If you're not willing, we have to face that. We're all serving someone or something. And so if you're not serving God, who or what are you serving? If you choose to love and serve the Lord, you've got to live it with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. If. Joshua gives the people the choice. So think about the covenants we make. God gives us the freedom to choose. In every marriage ceremony, before we even get started, I ask, is it your desire to enter into the covenant of marriage? At every baptism, I ask, is it your desire to have this child baptized? Is it your desire to be baptized? God allows us to choose because God wants us to love and serve freely. But once we do, God is a jealous God. And God in his holiness wants all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Joshua gives the people the choice. Joshua makes a very public promise. And that promise has inspired people of faith for thousands of years. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Period. Stop. And there is power in making public commitments, making promises and commitments in the presence of others. There is power in making promises and commitments surrounded by people who will encourage us to do what? Be strong and courageous. We can hear Joshua's declaration and get all inspired. That sounds really good. I'm going to commit myself and my house to serving the Lord. And then walk out the door and forget all about it. But Joshua, at the end of his life, reminds us this is not a one-time thing. There are miles of difference between making promises and keeping promises. And so even if we choose this day, we will need to choose tomorrow and we will need to choose every day. What Joshua received from Moses, he chose. He passed that to his people, and he passed that to the judges who would succeed him. A sacred link in the chain. We are a sacred link in the chain. 
At every baptism, we make promises to our children, to their families, to one another, and to God to help them discover who they are in covenant with God. We promise to share the stories of our faith, of what God has done in our lives. That's happening right now in McNaughton Hall with Mrs. Bird, and it's a lovely start to a new season. But I look at you here, and I say to you online and wherever you are, nurturing the faith of our young people is a promise all of us have made. We've made that promise to our children, and we've made that promise to God. And every baptism is a reminder that each one of us is called to find a way to help this congregation keep that promise. If we choose to serve the Lord, we have miles to go with the children in our care. And together we have promises to keep. God provided manna in the wilderness. And once across the Jordan, it stopped. Walking distance from here, there are people who are hungry, doing the best they can, but they still need help. If we choose to serve the Lord, we only have to go a mile or two to keep our promises. Manna for our brothers and sisters. After wandering in the wilderness for about a year and a half, walking distance from here, there are students who have fallen behind. Or worse, they're falling by the wayside. The way across the Jordan, for them that Jordan is floodwaters. How will those be parted? And the promise that comes with an education must seem unimaginable. A distant promise. They have miles to go, those young people, and they risk losing their way. And so if we choose to love and serve the Lord, keeping our promises could make every bit of sacred difference. Here we are in our Shechem. Even if you're on live stream, you're with us at Shechem. These are the stones that remind us of the faithful struggles often the faithful battles, the triumphs and the losses of all of those who have come before us in this place. So we worship together among these stones, and we remember that the Lord chooses us and rescues us and shepherds us and gives us blessings of which we are worthy only because God loves us. And we worship among these stones, and we remember God's promise to be with us, never forsaking us. And we sit among these stones and worship among these stones. And here we can pray for the courage to ask ourselves if we can or will choose to serve the Lord. We can pray that we might be strong and courageous enough to do so. Because Joshua will not let us off the hook. If we're not willing to serve the Lord, we're going to be serving one God or another. And so we at least have to be honest with ourselves about who or what that is. If we say, here I am, Lord. If we choose to serve, if we promise to serve, together we have miles to go and we have those promises to keep. And so as we worship among these stones, We can be strong and courageous and thankful because we will make those promises to God, to a God who makes all sacred covenants by making promises to us before we speak a word. And then I would say to us, as we leave these stones, may we remember that God goes with us, that sacred promise that God keeps. May we remember our promises. May we strengthen one another, encourage one another. And may God bless us in our choosing as each and every day we seek to be the people we have promised to become. Amen.